Okay, now let's welcome our second speaker, Professor Roberta Klaski. So Professor Klaski is the Charles Crennan Junior University Professor of Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science, American Association for the Advance of Science, the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science and the AAE. Professor Klaski's research investigates perceptions, uh, perception, spatial think thinking, and action for the perspective of multiple modalities, sensory and symbolics in real and working environments. So many of you probably have heard, uh, read her words uh, uh, developing exploration procedures as a human touch for understanding uh, physical properties of objects. And that has also been a good inspiration So many works in the field of active touch. Now let's welcome, uh, let's welcome Professor Klaski to the talk. Thank you very much for that introduction. I want to share a screen. Uh, can I do that here? Yes, please. Okay, that should work, one hopes. Is that good? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk today about my work uh, uh, really as a psychologist, cognitive science, a psychophysicist in vision and touch sensing uh, and how they are actually complementary sensory systems. Um, there are many collaborators on this work over the years, beginning with uh, Jack Loomis and Susan Lederman, and most recently with um, my colleague Bing Wu. And I'll talk quite a lot about the work we've been doing most recently. So my plan is to go just talk generally about geometric and material properties, to talk about different ways that the senses can potentially interact. Um, I'll then move to the case of uh, sensing that depends on multiple channels at the same time, the case of uh, weight, uh, uh, sorry, compliance perception, and, um, and then finally, uh, cross-modal correspondence effects. I think I might have weight in my slides, that's very funny. Okay, vision and touch, what do they do? Um, these systems have evolved uh, for uh, very different kinds of uh, functions. Vision is exemplary as the distal sense, that is, it sees the far world. Touch, of course, one knows only about interactions with the skin, muscle, tendons, and joints with the body in a fairly direct way. Even the warmth of the sun, we don't feel the sun, we feel the, the thermal changes on our skin. So from the outset, uh, these uh, channels are treated quite differently and um, lead to different kinds of uh, what is called modality appropriateness. I'll talk about that to a second in a second. But um, geometric properties are delivered very easily to the uh, visual modality, geometry being size, shape, and uh, the like. And material properties are delivered quite well to the touch modality. Uh, surface properties like roughness and friction, compliance like stiffness and viscosity, and thermal conductivity uh, are all very accessible and in the case of thermal flow, really exclusively available to uh, touch. So how do we know about these modality specializations? For decades, uh, psychologists have talked about them in sort of general terms, um, but in fact, uh, we now know much more about the neural pathways and cortical specialization of these different um, modalities. But when we get to geometry uh, and material, how do we know that these are differentially available? Well, shape, for example, you can, if you press down on your finger on a local shape element, you will get information from just that pressure point or that pressure distribution on the skin, which comes from uh, these mechanoreceptors called slowly adapting type 1. They're associated with the Merkel cell complexes in the finger. But that's just local shape information. Um, you're getting a pressure map. What about global shape? To do that, as it shows here from our haptic exploratory procedures, you need to stabilize the object and go around its edges, which is time consuming, requires integration in time and space, and involves kinesthetic receptors in muscle tendons and joints, as well as skin. Skin is giving you contact, but it's really the pathway that the, that the, um, the uh, effector is following that gives you shape. You see specialization when you ask people to make simple comparisons between physical objects that are in front of them. So we look at this little um, marshmallow and the cotton ball. We say, which is softer, uh, which is larger. If I ask a question like, which is larger or rounder, people will just look 
But if you ask a question like which is softer, you may get in fact touch. And then what we found was touch is not evoked if we know already the answer, like which is uh, rougher sandpaper versus silk. People will again look, they can, they can uh, get it from the particulate substance of the, of the surface. They know it from the semantics of, of silk and um, sandpaper. They will not touch. Touch is really very effortful. A lot of um, energy is used up in holding, man manipulating, and maneuvering objects to touch them. So people basically don't do exploratory touch unless they're forced to. We also see this by the speed of processing at the fingertip. This is early work of Susan's in mind with this very nice apparatus in which you can deliver unique surfaces to each of the three, each of the central three fingers on each hand. And we look at the time to detect whether there's one emergent different target amongst all of the others which are uniform as a function of the number of fingers that are actually stimulated. So here's looking for a rough surface, which would be this guy over here uh, in surfaces that are otherwise smooth and the response time is fast and independent of the number of fingers stimulated. On the other hand, uh, to get something like which side of a little dish a screw is located on, you'll see this tedious um, a mo movement of the fingers and we're at a 500 per finger, 500 millisecond per finger search rate. Edges and um, protuberances like that are in between. Edge versus no edge is easily detected, but the orientation of the edge again goes down to a fairly slow finger by finger search. So what I hope I've persuaded you is that there's a body of work that shows modality appropriateness with geometric features tilted toward vision and material properties tilted toward touch. So now let's talk about how we might put the two senses together. There are three models that I will con consider dominance, integration, and crosstalk. So here's the dominance model. We have uh, an input to the eye, we have an input to the hand, and we have an output that we want to judge, for example, surface roughness or shape, and we put them through the two channels, and one of the channels simply wins. Both of them come up with some kind of perceptual estimate of the property we want to know about. The two are independent, passed through, and at the end of it, only one sense dominates. The next one, which is probably familiar to many of us through the lovely work of, uh, of uh, Ernst and Banks, is maximum likelihood uh, integration, in which each of the senses has its own estimate and they're weighted according to the reliability of the two estimates and summed. And then we have what I'll call heuristic crosstalk, where you have influences from one sense that make you scratch your head, like why on earth did the estimate shift just because of this esoteric information that really doesn't provide a real uh, uh, perceptual estimate? And, and I'll talk about those as well. So scenario number one, pure dominance can be observed. This is the very classic work of Rock and Victor. People held a cube and looked at it through a distorting lens. The shape was distorted by the lens and people went along with the distortion, ignoring essentially what was in their pinch grasp in terms of knowing about the geometry of the object. But that's relatively rare. Uh, we do see it, however, in 2D pattern perception by the finger and vision touch would contribute nothing because by itself you cannot recognize raised line drawings that are portrayed through uh, just the, the usual edge elements we would quickly identify with vision. So in fact, people can explore these in raised line form uh, for minutes at a time and just be absolutely perplexed as what's there. And where does, uh, where is the limitation here? It turns out it's really in sort of a central process of integrating spatial information over time. You can get a very similar result if you force people to look at an object through an aperture that they move around over uh, time and space. And in fact, this nice experiment by Kappers and her group shows that it's not a peripheral limitation in taking in the edges from the touch sense, because if people in fact feel the edges and then draw them, and and look at what they've drawn, they have quite a high likelihood of being able to recognize what is there. So that means the information was always there at the fingertip. It was the integration across space that was possible with vision and not touch. So pure visual dominance. I've shown something similar with friction pack patterns that are presented to the skin. Um, this is with the T-pad device of uh, Ed Colgate's uh, uh, group. And in one case, we had people feel friction patterns like this that are very easily recognizably different by vision. 
people could find the friction patch very easily. They were given some patches on a tablet and all they had to do was report out which of these numbers had a friction patch behind it. They were completely accurate. They got them very quickly. But when we asked them to just match a friction pattern to its visual equivalent, they were at sea. They had no understanding of differences despite size differences, spatial frequency differences, and so on. Again, this is probably not a peripheral limitation. The device can handle these, but it probably is the result of spatiotemporal integration because you don't get friction unless you're moving in time through space. Scenario two is the more common one. That's where we have an integrated perceptual estimate uh, where we get estimates from two different senses. Each is, re is weighted by its reliability and we come up with an integration. What does it mean to weight by reliability? Well, if we think of each of these senses as giving us an estimate with a mean value somewhere here, and then they have a spread around it, that spread is its inverse reliability. And under the maximum likelihood model, what happens when you integrate the two of them is you come up with an estimate that's in between the means of the two core distributions and has less variability than either of the distributions that's contributed. So you get a win in precision and you get an, a compromise in the weighted average. Does it happen? Yes, Ernst and Banks showed that it did, did happen in perceiving geometric features, but only when the geometric cues were really uh, made unreliable. So here's a person seeing stereo disparities that give rise to the idea that this part of a, of a surface is below this central edge. They simultaneously felt the edge and with phantom robots were prevented from pinching more than this distance. And they had to use the haptic estimate of this distance and the visual disparity based estimate to come up with an idea of how big the edge was. With some cool psychophysics, we can estimate the relative weighting of vision and touch. And when vision has the full disparity Q, it's a visual weight really is very dominant over touch. But you can now introduce noise perturbation around these um, disparities to get a kind of blurry depth map. And very quickly, vision goes down in weight, touch goes up in weight. So this is a nice example of integration. I showed something uh, similar working with um, uh, Kurt Drewing, and um, this is uh, using it uh, in a texture mode where we had people looking at these uh, textures that were created by raised elements and feeling them. What we see is what we would expect. We get a bimodal estimate of roughness that's in between the haptic and visual and is tilted toward haptic and that in fact matches, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's actually tilted. I think I mis mislabeled these. It's, til it's tilted toward the more reliable one. And that, in this case, is actually the visual one. Sorry about that. I have to relabel my, my drawing. But it, it, it works. It, it does follow the likelihood model. OK, scenario three, intersensory interaction, heuristic crosstalk. What does that mean? It means some sense comes in with an estimate that we say, where on earth did it come from? One of my absolute favorite examples is not vision and touch, but rather vision and smell. You have people looking at something like an apple, and their job is to just grasp the apple. And we look at the peak aperture width that they have as they go into grasp. When people smell a grapefruit just before they reach for the apple, they have a bigger aperture than if they've previously smelled a small thing like a strawberry. And you can flip it around. Uh, if you have them reaching for a small thing, you can make it, their grasp bigger. If you have them reaching for a big thing, you can make them have the grasp smaller. But their grasp, which is really a beautiful way of saying what their perceptual estimate is, is affected by this odd smell pathway that has no real perceptual estimate for the size of an object. It's really a memory association that's being triggered. I demonstrated something similar with my colleague uh, Bing Wu, where we had people just estimating how deep they pushed a probe into uh, a surface that had a physical stop, but it also had an elastic resisting surface. So they felt a resisting force as they went in. And we asked them to just draw the indented distance, which is this physical indent here. The stiffer the elastic that they pushed against, the deeper they thought they were pushing. 
The elastic gave them no in real in information about the indented value, but they were using their understanding of springs or their mental model of springs to associate a deeper push with a more resisting uh, force value. And therefore, no matter what the physical indent was, it was inflated by pushing against a stiffer, more resistant uh, surface. There are many heuristic cues that we could look at in vision, for example, here's just a nice example where the illumination on a surface and the perspective viewing angle change its apparent visual roughness. I've never had people give me roughness judge judgments of lemons, but I'm perfectly willing to bet that if I illuminated them differently or had them look from different angles, they'd come up with different roughness values. And this would be the introduction of this very odd heuristic cue. It has no real uh, estimate associated with it. In fact, it's a a pseudo cue called shadow hiding, where you could actually have surfaces occluding their own um, shadows. Okay, now I'd like to go to hybrid properties uh, and the case of stiffness perception. And that's a cool one because stiffness is the result of two uh, different uh, perceptual estimates being present at the same time. One is the distance that you've moved and the other one is the force that you feel at a particular point in time. So here's a person looking at a spring, they see it going down a distance D and they feel a particular force. And by Hooke's law, they should come up with some kind of stiffness estimate that's K equals F over D. In this case, vision is very good at signaling the geometric property of uh, deformation distance, but you need touch to get the resisting force. Um, in general, force cues to haptics are very weak. Uh, you might see the thickness of a spring or you might see a deformation outline over a surface, but uh, if you take the force cues from distance away, essentially you have a bimodal judgment with respect to distance because you can see your hand moving. You also would get a purely unimodal force cue for haptics. So how are these put together? Uh, my colleague Bing Wu and I found that in fact, visual cues do contribute to stiffness. That's the first step in asking what's going on here. In this case, we added a very strong visual cue. We had people feeling in a butterfly haptics magnetic levitation force resistive device where they pushed on a virtual spring. They also saw a simulation of a def deformation flow. So it was simulated ultrasound where the deformation could clearly be seen in the shift in the speckle pattern as they pushed downwards so that we gave them a very strong visual flow cue and what we found was that uh, as we introduced a visual lag so that the visual feedback came after the force we found that the perceived stiffness changed quite a lot and this is from a, a, an experiment where people match um, they say whether a reference uh, lag is exceeded by or less than a comparison. And we added our stiffness to the, uh, to the reference. And as we made, sorry, we added the lag to the reference. And as we added it, the point of subjective equality where they matched the stiffness of the comparison spring went up. Why should visual lag create enhanced stiffness? It's because there's this very, very short period of time, and we're talking on the order of just 100 milliseconds or so, where they are getting a, um, a increase in force without any knowledge about an increase in distance. And that lag then creates the illusion that you have more force for smaller distance. And in fact, you have a stiffer estimate that comes out of the system as a result. I hope that's clear. So the lags is, ooh, I've got a big increase in force. Nothing's happening on a distant side. Although the lags are too short for people to know that consciously. They do not recognize that there is this del delay particularly. So we've looked more recently in detail at what visual lag does to stiffness uh, judgments. When you have a 166 millisecond lag in the distance Q, exploration slows down. It, it gets uh, shorter in duration. Perhaps more interesting is it gets less precise. So there's a 35% increase in the just noticeable difference for stiffness. That's the minimum change in the stiffness that you need in order to recognize two springs are different. So people have an less ability to discriminate springs by a 35% increase in the JND uh, under this uh, delay. 
And we also found that the JND is saved to some extent if people do more cycles of pushing in and retracting the spring. So they're on a virtual spring. As they explore more, they get more precise. This does not happen when there is no visual latency. So we wanted to use a model we had previously developed to explain these interesting effects that vision introduces when we bring it in conjunction with touch. Our original model was touch only, and we uh, <laughs> there's quite a literature on how people judge a stiffness, but we introduced the concept of moment-to-moment -moment iterative modulation of the stiffness estimate using a Bayesian sort of discounting. So let me explain how the model works. It says that any time you're at a current level of displacement of your spring, and you have a current stiffness estimate, when you push a little more, you get a change in the distance and you can compute a new distance and a new force and you actually compute a new estimate of K for just that new uh, uh, state change of a, the, the distance has changed slightly, the force of state change. Uh, change slightly. We also add a, a component to the model in which we bring in encoded perceived distance and force using Stevens power laws. In fact, the Stevens exponent for distance seen by vision is one, so no distortion there. But there is a force um, uh, escalation of, of a 1.4 estimate, so that's in the model. Anyway, you get a state change you compute your new value of K, given now what distance you have total and what force you have uh, all together, and you combine it with your previous estimate to come up with a new global stiffness uh, measure. This is a weighted sum where the weight you give to the previous estimate and the amount that you give to your new changed estimate is, as it says here, inversely related to the local change. In other words, if you've previous step you had k and all of a sudden your new estimate changes a lot, you discount it down. The other thing is you have a running estimate of the standard deviation of your previous k judgments. And so those previous k judgments, if they're reliable, you have a very low standard deviation on them, you don't want to change much. So one more time, you push a little, you come up with a new k estimate, you don't use that, you integrate it with the previous k estimates, discounting the new one if it's a big change, and discounting the new one if you already feel you're stable with respect to the previous estimate. So this is basically um, how Kalman filters work. This is a very Bayesian notion. And these are just the uh, details of the, um, of the uh, algorithm. But new estimate integrated with old, discounted if big change, discounted if old is stable. To test the model, we did something diabolical that one would find hard to do with real springs, although they exist, and that was to create springs which, as you push along them, the local K is changing. So their stiffness is actually being modulated in space and time as you push. And people here pushed according to this guideline. They pushed a certain amount and then uh, stopped and made their K estimates. Here are the different kinds of springs we use. In some cases, as you went along the spring trajectory, first the K increased and then it went decrease. And then sometimes it started out with a, a decrease in K and then as you went along it, it increased. And then we had the half sign equivalent of it where it just very slowly increased and then came back to baseline. And across all of our experiments, we had all of these parametric changes in our nonlinear springs. And of course, people came out with different K estimates for all these different cases, but they were sensitive to the modulation along the path. They didn't just read out at the end so that these two conditions would be equal and these ones would be equal and so on. They actually were affected by the moment to moment change in the stiffness of the spring. So here's our model fit to the data from those experiments. We actually found that our model with uh, just one parameter, which was this uh, scaling on the weight change, um, fit all these different sine wave and half sine wave modulations of the K value as you went along the spring, and as well all of the different uh, baseline K values that we had used. For all these conditions then, we had a very nice viable model of moment to moment iterative updating of your estimate of the stiffness of the spring as you explore by touch. Now, another nice feature of the model is we can actually see 
what these moment to moment changes are. So here's a full sign spring where the physical force uh, of the physical K first uh, increases and decreases as you go along it. The perceived force changes by a slightly different uh, amount because of our assumption of the 1.4 exponent. We come up with a current uh, stiffness level. We have an SD on all our prior stiffness over time. This is how we change the K. And finally, we read out at the very end a final value for our K. Now, adding vision to this, we have to explain why this optically flowing uh, visual distance cue might affect stiffness judgment of the spring. So we told our subjects that, in fact, they were seeing ultrasound of a spring <laughs> so that they could take the flow into account. And our, our ongoing model assumes that when they are looking how far they've depressed the spring, they're 50-50 with the kinesthetic cues from touch and the flow field from vision. We assume the only force cue that they get is by touch. They can't see their hand, their physical hand. It's hidden below this uh, shield. We assume that as they go back and forth along the spring, which they do, uh, that during the loading phase, they're changing more than during the unloading phase. And this is consistent with other estimates of loading and unloading and how much it changes the estimate of spring stiffness. It's also consistent with just what happens when you feel a spring and you push down against the resisting force, you have to exert very uh, precise control. Coming back, you can almost ride the spring back, so you're not really perceiving in the same way. Anyway, we assume that at the very end, you read out a stiffness estimate that reflects your, uh, the processes of in integrating vision and touch for distance and using force only for touch. And we also can read out the just noticeable difference that we would expect because of the variability of the K estimates as we went along. So here's how the model works. This is now with multiple cycles of exploration. So here's a loading and an unloading, uh, one exploratory cycle. And uh, we're assuming then that as we go through these multiple cycles, uh, these uh, force and deformation are ongoing. Our J and D is, uh, the, well, this is the output of the, uh, sorry, this is the output stiffness. This is the variability on the moment to moment stiffness judgments. And we can see what happens as we introduce visual lag by this nice little animation. Uh, this is zero lag. As we start to add lag, which is, we can start to see the lag creep up here in the deformation, um, we get a change in the J and D. We get a change in the stiffness. And so the model is actually saying that uh, we are in introducing lag effects. It's also saying that the effects of lag depend on the iterative way in which you're exploring the spring over cycles. So our simulations account for the main uh, uh, findings that we had when we introduced visual lag and stiffness. We came up with uh, a, a dependence on the number of interactions per trial of both the J and D, and the, uh, this is the J and D over here, and the ultimate stiffness estimate. Uh, the, and the stiffness estimate is growing uh, with a number of interactions, but it, and is affected by the visual latency here. And basically, our new model with integrated vision and touch uh, works. OK, so that's a kind of complicated story, but it tells you how, in fact, you might have to get down and dirty in order to handle vision touch interactions. You have to get into the process by which they're integrated, how the estimates change over time, and the way in which people, in fact, take care of ongoing, um, the ongoing um, accrual of information. I'd like to end by talking more speculatively about the phenomenon of cross-modal co correspondence, which is a way that vision and touch can interact, but in a, a more perverse or at least, say, um, less understood way. So cross-modal correspondences occur when things just seem to go together. And I'll give you the classic example is the booba and kiki shape. So if I ask people in my audience which of these shapes they'd like to call booba and which they'd like to call kiki, and you all come to an answer in your heads, I think most of you will like booba for this shape on the right right and kiki for the shape on the left that's found cross culturally it's found when you explore the shapes with touch and uh, it's uh, been traced to the actual way in which we say booba and kiki uh, for the linguists among 
amongst us, these actually differ in the place of articulation, that is where you restrict and stop air, whether the vowel is front or back, the vowel roundedness. And when you have a rounded shape <laughs> and a voice consonant, you uh, of your of your mouth and a back vowel, you tend to like it for rounded shapes in the world. And when you have stops, which are very abrupt uh, constrictions of air, unvoiced consonants, so you get the pop without moving your vocal cords, and you use the front of your mouth, you like kiki type. Uh, that's kiki type words. You like that with the spiky shapes more. So that would be interesting, perhaps, just from a linguistic perspective. But it turns out that when you look at the perceptual results of having these labels and shapes actually match their natural correspondences, you find that the degree to which you get a match between color and, and uh, shape or label and shape, you get a lot of interesting effects. If color to shape binding is stronger when the color is matched to the sh shape in this correspondence way, you get enhanced perceptual discriminations. That is, you tell shapes apart better. You get altered signals in brain activity. Your brain knows, in fact, whether you have congruent or incongruent labels. And you also tend to like things more when they have a congruent cross-modal correspondence. Color is interesting because not only does it show color shape of associations in vision, uh, you can get color touch associations across the two modalities. So even infants will show you a preference for the red circles and the green triangles. This goes away as the infant develops over the first six months of, of life, and it's a, replaced by other color shape preferences that just arise from the things that we encounter in our culture. So there's quite a nice story behind color shape. When it comes to color matched to a vibrotactile stimulation, this is work that I did uh, with uh, my colleagues at Disney, uh, we found very strong color vibration uh, preferences such that uh, Low frequencies were associated down here with a violet hue and high frequency, really buzzy ones up here with the uh, green hue. And uh, this is uh, in C-Lab space associated with a, a certain number of degrees in C-Lab space. And also amplitude caused a change in the hue toward red. So as we um, uh, increased the, uh, am the amplitude, the convergence on the red here, except for the very highest, buzziest sounds, was very pr pronounced. And so high intensity went with the red color. So we could ask whether, in fact, we might get kind of oddball touch vision correspondences where we would change perceptual estimates just on the basis of um, their associated um, color or their associated um, label. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's two textures. I've called one Keti, which is an almost optimal uh, uh, label for uh, spiky shapes, and Lubojo, which is a very uh, a nice one for rounded uh, shapes. And the question is, when I call this Keti and I call this Lubojo, would you in fact come up with different perceptual estimates if you were touching them at the same time? You'll have to ask yourself that. Um, but I think that that would be a fun experiment uh, to do. So would, that would be a label biasing haptic uh, roughness. I could um, also bring in the um, I could I could bring in equivalent uh, surface maps, in, and but in that case, vision would be offering you perhaps a really good different uh, perceptual estimate, and it and it wouldn't be one of these arbitrary correspondences anymore. How about color? Here are two surfaces, one colored uh, red and one colored uh, green. If we saw the blurry shape with these filters over them and you touched a green or touched a red, would you feel anything different when it came to the intrinsic um, roughness? And again, you can ask yourself whether this kind of trick might uh, work. And to the extent that it did, what would it say about how vision and touch interact? It brings us very far away from the models we began with, which is each one coming up with a perceptually based estimate that they then get put together. So that's my talk. I realized I went fairly quickly, but I was given a stern warning about the 40 minutes. I think I actually made it a little fast. But basically, to reprise my, to reprise my uh, uh, talk, I talked about the idea that vision and, and touch have intrinsic perceptual specializations, which leads them to have um, more favored ways of delivering information about material and geometry. I talked about 
the scenarios by which those interactions could occur, one, one of them dominating the other one, uh, or the two being integrated by weight. I went into detail on a hybrid property to uh, just explain that I think we need very uh, clear and detailed models about intersensory interactions in order to really be able to predict what will happen when the modalities come together. But then me being me, I flipped it at the end to the much more speculative idea that we could have interactions between the modalities when in fact there's no reason to uh, feel that one of them is coming up with a true perceptually based estimate at all. It might be a memory based estimate or it might be just some very um, wacko correspondence that seems to have ar arisen by either uh, experience or um, underlying variables we don't know about. So that is my talk. I thank you for your attention. I thank Bing Wu for all the fun work we've had on our on our stiffness model uh, and uh, my other many collaborators in touch, far too many to uh, talk about here, and also to the funding agencies that have made this work possible over the years. So now I'll just ask if there are any questions. Thanks for the presentation, Professor Flasky. So uh, you learned a lot from it. Okay, now, uh, any questions from the audience? So I see Lorenzo has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very, a lot of uh, interesting information. Uh, I hope you, excuse me if I will ask you a question that is not exactly related to something you presented, but I mean related, but not something that you did present. Uh, if we are, uh, as humans, if we are, if we have two objects and we have to tell which one is bigger, we have to uh, judge the volume. Mm -hmm. Are we better at doing that with vision or with touch? Oh, it, indisputably uh, with vision. Um, uh, it, it would depend to some extent. I mean, we could go into how big are the objects? Do they fit within your fist or something like that? But that's kind of the hallmark of the sort of uh, discrimination that I think vision is really um, uh, uh, there to produce, especially as they get out of the scale of a single uh, enclosure within the hand, you would you would end up, then you would now have to get this dimension and that dimension and so on. Vision would be much better at taking up projections, you know, little spiky projections or something into account to get global volume and so on. So there's no, there's no question. And in fact, when we ask people to look at objects and tell us which is bigger, and we're talking about real three-dimensional scaled objects, they don't use their hands. That's one of the cases in which they just go, Oh, the one on the right. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Emily? Uh, yeah, I had a question about, um, so a lot of this work shows the comp, like how touch and vision all interact together. Um, but what about if someone is born without vision? Um, do they compensate in other ways? How do these results change? Have you looked into that at all? Well, I've worked a lot with, with the blind and there, and if uh, people have a past experience with vision, it's a, it's a different story. So let's talk about people who have never had sight and now they have a large area of cortex that, or, I mean, <laughs> vision is arguably what a huge amount of your cor cortex is, is, is interested in. And what one finds is that the uh, occipital lobe functions uh, are basically devolve to spatial functions and other modalities. So people who are congenitally blind will, for example, show huge activation in V1 when they're reading Braille or doing echolocation, both spatial tasks. And uh, people who are, um, are deprived of sight much later are not going to be able to have that kind of flexibility. Although if you were a blindfold for a long time, you'll start to show activation changes in V1. So V1 won't just stay there and be labile. And, and so, yes, there are uh, visual, there are spatial functions that are taken over by visual cortex. Blind do show better uh, sensory discrimination in some tasks like a visual, uh, sorry, auditory localization in, and so azimuthal localization. Also, uh, there's some uh, work suggesting a better uh, discrimination to point to touch discrimination. Certainly braille readers will show much better um, uh, acuity in the fingertip across the lifespan. Uh, Gordon Leggy's work shows this. And in fact, they basically show almost a constant um, threshold for uh, acuity across lifespan where the rest of us at around age 50 
those elevator buttons so you know that are marked in braille we can we wouldn't even be able to tell you what the what the embossed pattern was let alone decode it so uh, there are there are very great differences but we would we should not think that uh, uh, people who have been deprived of, 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 of sight don't have spatial abilities in fact every virtually everything i've ever tested them on they're they're extremely good they just work in a world in which the three-dimensionality comes from the touch sense Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I really enjoyed your talk and I say I've really enjoyed reading your papers and reviews as well. Um, so I wanted to ask about um, relationship to decision making because so some of the some of the models you have seem to be a bit like a bit well we're basically based in the evidence integration model, the Kalman filter, and other models seem more similar to kind of shortcut you know, the kind of shortcut or heuristics like Daniel Kahneman type. Mm -hmm. So which is it? Is it kind of both? Or is it some in some circumstances? Or it, what would be your view? Well, I'm very fond of uh, Kahneman and his ideas. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that we could find some of these sort of heuristic judgment and biases. But most perceptual decisions, I kind of like a, a fairly simple uh, a statistical decision model where you end up with some kind of likelihood ratio axis and then you basically put a cut point on it and you come up with a bias uh, and, 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 and a sensitivity parameter. That works pretty well for me. Uh, the nice thing about the, this um, Kalman filter type approach is it accounts for the additional situation in which you're iter iteratively changing and revising your estimate. And that's not in classical signal detection models. But any student who's ever been in the course of mine learns <laughs> statistical decision making models and probably is about at the bar level for them at the end of the course because as far as I'm concerned they they are absolutely necessary to understand where perceptual judgments eventually you have to either jump or not jump you know what I mean so where does that come from many many decisions are, are binary and binary models are great. Can I, can I follow that up so since you like statistical decision making models what about cost? Oh, I have a whole take on cost. There's, a, there's actually some wonderful work on how costs modulate um, the decisions you should make. Um, there's a paper that I'm really uh, very fond of, um, and I'm, I'm going to blank on, on the author's name here. But basically, the idea is the the more sensitivity you have, so the higher your D prime type parameter, your A parameter, whatever it is, then the less uh, you should be biased by cost. But if you don't have good statistical information at the sensitivity level, you should basically move toward the conservative when you have really high costs for you know, errors, or you should move toward the liberal when you have very high payoffs for getting things right and not too much cost for errors. And there's, I can just visualize these functions and how they basically come out of these very biased frames into being very close to neutral. One, once you know the answer, just think about it at the extreme. Once you know the answer, D prime is essentially infinite or you have 100% of the area under the curve, you would never think about costs because you, know, you don't have to. So, and that's basically the idea, but uh, uh, bringing costs into the equation and, and people do, I mean, we have to bring in evolutionary costs after all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Chow? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. That's really, I really enjoy the, the, uh, your talk from the psychology side. Uh, because I'm a one guy from robotics domain, and I really want to get your suggestion and uh, your um, idea. For example, sometimes um, in your psychology experiments, you need a lot of very complex device in order to buy some not, not bias somehow try to avoid the human, um, how to say human. Um, um, in somehow kind of intention. So in this case, maybe machine is a kind of good device. <clears throat> a pure machine is good, a good device for, for evaluation or for more to, to, um, to evaluate your model. Do some suggestion, for example, model this vision and tactile domain, do some suggestion, for example, whether we can use uh, uh, robotics to do the experiments for uh, evaluate your, your model or something like that. So just want to get suggestion from you. Mm -hmm. 
So you, I would say the answer is yes and the answer is no. You can get a certain amount of traction from uh, having the robot do the job and, and figuring out what works, but you're going to miss all sorts of things. You're going to miss the intrinsic transduction process where, by which the human receptor populations bring in the perceptual mm -hmm. estimates. And that's things like that 1.4 exponent that we had to put on the force. So not all force increments are equal if you understand what I'm saying. And so you will also miss the fact that in human, so it really depends on whether you want to model the human, but humans do have, going back to the heuristics and biases idea, humans have to have heuristics because we have underdeterministic data. So I'm sure you've all seen these beautiful illusory um, contours, the Kanishiwa, a Christmas tree, where you have, you see edges that aren't there. Those are actually indications that the human visual system has to make assumptions that there's an occluder there and the edge is really persisting behind the occluder. We don't know, in that case, it's an invisible occluder because it melts into the background and that's the beauty of those illusions. But you would miss the fact that there are all these heuristic rules that are embedded very deeply in the unconscious parts of human perception. So to model the human, you basically have to test the human. Now there's an awful lot of human data out there. So if you're savvy enough to go out there and, and, and develop models that not only use the robot, but embody the robot with some of the biases that we have in our perceptual system, then I think you're fine to go ahead and do predictive uh, uh, simulations. I, and I have no quarrel about it. The better the model, is of the human, the more predictive it is of the model. And if you want to make predictions about the robot, stick with the robot. That's what I would say. Sean? Okay. Um, a very impressive talk. Uh, um, and I really enjoyed the, um, uh, the talk. And uh, the same as, uh, uh, as Nathan, I also got a lot of uh, inspirations from, from your talk and also your publications. Um, so uh, we have got one paper uh, two years ago on this cross-model generation of uh, visual tactile data generation in robotics. So it's quite related to what you have presented is cross-model um, perception. So we have generated these uh, texture images, these tactile images or visual images from the other modality. And so you have mentioned, you have, we can have this cross-model perception of stiffness, color. Um, my question is, so for humans, do we train ourselves for this cross-model perception or uh, can we train ourselves for better cross-model perception and how? <laughs> well, certainly I think that um, the, the most basic mechanisms for integration are formed in the very first uh, waves of exploring. And you can actually see this in the infant development um, literature. Are, are kids surprised when the roughness of the thing they're touching does not match what they expected from vision and so on. So you can, you can see that kids are not necessarily born with exactly the kinds of cross-modal correspondences they'll end up with later or with the, um, the cross-modal influences, but they're experiencing all the time. Kids never stop fingering and jamming and, and ba banging. And so they're really developing these correlations all the way along. Can we get better? Well, yes, we, if we change one of the channels by itself, of course, then we'll get a better perceptual estimate from that channel. So we might learn to discriminate roughness, for example, by practicing a lot. Then we might weight tactile roughness more than if we were untrained. But we flip those weights on the fly, of course, we put on a glove and suddenly we're not gonna give the same weight either. Now, if you're asking, can we get better at integrating, as I understand um, the uh, maximum likelihood model, it's the best, it's the best that we can do. So really the question is, how can we always get to that model? And Mark Ernst has done a lot of really cool stuff on what makes the model break down. So for example, if you have people feeling and touching in two different locations, they don't make the attribution that they're coming from the same object in the world. The model very quickly become non-maximum non likelihood. They're no longer doing optimal integration. So it's very fragile and it's very labile what we do is I say, you know, we just, we, we're, we're very quick to, to understand the changes in our perceptual capabilities and to start changing our weights. Great. Many thanks for your answers, Arupata. Okay, let's just break the rule here and do two more questions. Uh, Lezik? Uh, 
Yes, so uh, it was very, very interesting presentation. Uh, so you mentioned in, during one of your answers for the questions uh, about the blind people and about the cortex ac activation. I'm a little bit curious uh, if you know, so if someone uh, lose, uh, became blind at some point of, of, of uh, his or her life, uh, if you monitor the, the cortex activation, will the, the parts of the brain will be activated? Uh, for example, if someone discovers some objects, will the parts responsible for the vision will be activated as they were before the person lost uh, a vision or, or is it some different process? So for example, if some part of the brain is activated normally when persons see uh, and recognize faces, so there is some part of the brain responsible for face recognition. And then after some time, the person needs to learn how to recognize faces by the touch, will the same part of the brain will be activated? That's uh, just something I'm a little bit wondering now. Yeah, uh, as well, as a matter of fact, the fusiform face area is activated inside people by seeing faces and by touching faces. So you will, and, and, and uh, the, the place area is in the, in the brain is activated by seeing scenes and also by touching layouts that are miniature layouts of, of scenes. And so there's, a, there's this um, uh, perihippocampal place area. And so these areas are intrinsically multimodal already. If you go to the parts of the brain that really seem to be like dedicated to early processing, like um, the edge detectors in vision, would they be activated by feeling edges with a particular orientation? I, I suspect that's been done, but I don't know. I, I know that my uh, uh, that Steve Coslin has thought that sighted people, if they're asked to imagine really detailed edge discriminations, actually activate V1. But that's not been shown because he didn't have the measuring apparatus mm. that, that could separate V1 from nearby adjacent occipital areas. So I suspect the work's been done and I just don't know it. But once you've had visual experience, I, I don't think you shed entirely what the brain was supposed to be doing. And in fact, that's part of the message is that it's not completely plastic. If you develop blindness later in life, you do not reprogram the brain. Echolocation is a great example. People who are congenitally blind use good echolocators, activate V1 for echolocation. Uh, people who are blind, even say at an, at, as an adolescent, don't show the same V1 activation and don't show the same uh, d degree of ability to do echolocation. Okay, great, thank you. Last question, Gordon. I can ask a hundred questions. Thank you for your talk. Um, it just we many of these discussions remind me of a, a very old conversation I had with a, a English gentleman. He passed away some years ago. Uh, Richard Gregory. Oh, I know Richard. Gregory, yeah, hero. And yeah. You know how penetrating he is when he went go into discussion, and he's even worse when you have more sake and whiskey. Uh, so the, the conversation we were having was about touch and sight. He said he had one, one gentleman subject that it was very interesting. He lost his sight very young, and then he learned how to, uh, you know, uh, what do they call them? Touch to read. A braille. You mean braille, yeah. yeah. And then he said it was remarkable after the surgery that the subject could be uppercase character with sight. With that sight, was, oh. That blew my mind. <laughs> I'm not quite understanding. He had surgery to correct his blindness. Yeah, he had the company. Uh, A cataract be, removal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. After many years, he's adult. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and that was remarkable to show that um, how much overlapping tactile and visual Actually, there has been quite a, a wave of recent work with a group of, uh, of people who were uh, blind uh, from birth in India. I, I think it's called Prashad, but it might be Prathad. But in any case, they, they have, in some cases, corrective lenses alone have been able to give them something beyond just lightness vision. And these people have been monitored in a series of articles in, in um, what most typically happens is when they first, in fact, uh, Dick Held, another <clears throat> great vision scientist, uh, studied one uh, set who immediately after 
surgery, he asked them to do the classic Molino problem. Could they discriminate a cube in a sphere? Yeah. And they could actually do it by each modality, but they could not do cross-modal matching. So they couldn't feel the sphere and then be able to pick out which one they had felt and, and so on. And okay. so, uh, but within a week, they were able to do it. Okay. Week. Yeah. So what typically happens is that mid-level vision where you have par static parsing where things are overlapping and occluding, that takes months, if not years of practice with vision to develop and some people don't develop it. But very early on, they can do quite remarkable visual things, including I have read Ponzo illusion where you have the railroad tracks with the line in the front and, and you see them differential in size. So we really have a lot to learn from these um, special cases where people are suddenly given uh, vision, but there's a lot of idiosyncrasies in that literature too. Okay, uh, just one small comment. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, we can have a very long discussion sometime later. Okay. Uh, would you have a use for pressure sensor for monitoring finger manipulation without sensory interference? Whoa, I don't know how to parse that. Okay, so uh, a, a collaborator of mine, uh, we develop a nano mesh sensor. That Why don't we talk about this offline? Actually, you know, if, if you just want to write me an email, we can set up a Zoom or a, even an exchange of paper. And there's no interference. We show there's no interference to the subject. And I'm I think very, that connects I'm, to yeah, the I'm very, you're, you're, you're wearing it, but it doesn't it distort your ordinary sense of touch. It will measure the pressure, mm -hmm. but does not interfere with your own uh, sense of touch. I think that would be very interesting. Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, we just published that a, a few months ago. Can you send me the paper? Yeah, I, I can send it to you now. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Thanks, our presenter again.